series uh, at the table. And, and last week, we looked at this idea of what kind of shepherd is, is leading you and leading my life. Uh, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life for my sheep. He says, I, I, I want to... I want to lead you in and lead you out, lead you to, to, to beside the still waters and to the green pastures. I want to walk th- with you through the valley of the shadow of the death. I want to prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. I want your cup to overflow. I want to anoint your head with oil. I want you to be able to say, surely in goodness are following me all the days of my life. And I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord Forever, because I'm following the good shepherd. And, and, and if you're following the good shepherd, then the want meter goes down, and the, and the fear meter goes down, and the anxiety meter, and the, just the rushing around in life goes down, because I'm following the good shepherd, and he's in control of my life, and I'm, I'm following his voice. Amen? And that's what Jesus desires for every single one of us. This is for everyone. The table is for everyone. And that's what we want to have happen to, to, in the mind and the heart of every person here today. But also, it's the mission of God's church that every person who is looking at the church from the outside and wondering if they have a place in church, that they too will understand this reality, that they too would be awakened to this possibility that, that, that the promises and the purpose and the, and the power of God can be accessed by everyone and that they too are a part of everyone this isn't an insider's club amen it's not it's not for a select few it isn't for those who came from the right family or the right background situation or the right spiritual makeup uh, or the ones who just haven't screwed up too badly in life this is for everyone we love the great assembly here at pcn we also recognize that everybody needs to be a part of a community Because it's in that circle of relationship and of belonging, of community, of growth, if I can say it this morning, of accountability, that you will tap into everything that God is wanting you to be. So we looked last week, and we're going to continue this week, seeking to answer this question, am I in a circle? Who is in my circle? Who who knows me? Where do I fit in? Where do I belong? So that I can be a part of what God wants to do. But also, who have I invited who am I sharing this message of love, like Kurt said? Who have I identified the needs that, that this person needs an invitation? Right, both here in our community and, and out there. So they can also be a part of what God wants to do. This is the invitation of Jesus, and it is extended to everyone. Last week we looked at John chapter 10. We talked about the shepherd and the sheep. And there's this beautiful illustration of, of this everyone idea in the previous chapter. So if you have your scripture with you, I invite you to join me in John chapter 9 this morning. John chapter 9. And uh, while you're turning there, before we look at this amazing story together, I want to unpack this idea of everyone for a moment and give you a handful of things that I believe God desires for everyone. Okay. So if you're a note taker, here's the first one. I'm just going to go through these. Number one is everyone can matter to God. Everyone can matter to God. And I'm thinking about uh, how many people in Painesville, Ohio, let alone all of the surrounding communities around our our city who do not know today that they are on heaven's radar. That they're not accidental or, or, or incidental. That they are purposed by God. That God sees them and he knows them. That he's aware of them, that they are valuable to him, that their life matters to God, both in heaven and here while they're on the earth. And friends, everyone can know that. Everyone can know that, and everyone needs to know that, that they matter to God. That when they wake up and take a breath, and their feet hit the floor in the morning, they know, I matter to God. And that's now the operating point from which I go about my life. That's now the operating point from which I'm going to move out into the world and the way that they discover that people outside of the church discover that they matter to God is because we let them know that. Secondly, everyone can know God's love. I love the way that Eugene Peterson translates 
uh, this passage, Psalm 36. This won't be up on the screen, but listen to this. This is the message translation. He says, God's love is meteoric. His loyalty astronomic is astronomic. His purpose is titanic. His verdict's oceanic. Yet in his largeness, nothing gets lost. Not a man, not a mouse slips through the cracks. Everyone can knows that God sees them. And everyone can know that this God who sees them, that he also loves them. This is for everyone. And my prayer today is that, that somebody, even today, would get this revelation sight. That maybe you would walk out of church today. Maybe for the first time, maybe in a long, first time in a long time, believing, man, God doesn't hate me. God loves me. He's not against me. He's, he's for me. And that every single one of us might walk out these doors back into the world today and tell somebody else, God loves you. God's not against you. God is for you. He hasn't written you off. He wants to write you into this story. How do I know? Because his son stretched out his arms on the cross and gave his life for me. This is Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Everyone needs to know that they can know and experience the love of God. The third one, everyone can be forgiven. Everyone can be called a child of God. Everyone can be changed and become an agent of change. Everyone has equal access to become a part of this family of God. See, the lie of the enemy is that this is available to someone, right? Somebody can get that. Somebody can understand that. Someone can be changed. Somebody is invited to the table, but not everyone. Maybe someone can share their faith. Maybe someone can see a coworker, a family member, a friend go from death to life, but it's probably not going to be you. It probably isn't going to be them. And he'll help, he'll help you understand that, the enemy will. It's probably not going to be you. See, you and I need to understand that voice of the enemy is a lie from hell, friends. That God is flinging the doors open today with the message that salvation, forgiveness is for everyone. Everyone can be forgiven. Right along with that, number four, everyone is a part of the gospel story. God wants to write everybody into this story. Everyone has equal access to the things of God. Everyone can understand the scriptures and put memory to the scriptures. Everyone can commune with God in a meaningful way, in an intimate way. Everyone can renew their minds to the truth and, and, and find their God-given gifting and learn to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Everyone can learn to share their faith, to raise other people up to live in this supernatural story. It's for everyone. It isn't limited to pastors or evangelists. It's not limited to, to some, you know, the special people or someone who has a, you know, they're, they're like super Christians. This is for everyone. The gospel story is for everyone. Who are you inviting to the table? Everyone can shape history through prayer. You know, it's amazing. Studies actually show that the church doesn't pray. It would make sense if I told you the world doesn't pray. Statistics show that the average Christian does not pray. Yeah, we pray when our, when our family's going through the, the mud. We, we pray when we're up against it. Yeah, we call in the name of the Lord. We, we, we pray when we, when we get that, that phone call from the doctor with the bad news. We pray when our, we're about to lose our job. We send out that SOS to God, but... but consistently, faithfully, regularly on our knees saying, God, I believe that what I'm doing right here can, can, can change my brother's life, can change my family, can change my community, can change my city or my state, my country, that I can change the direction of the nation and the world. Everyone has access to the throne of God through faithful prayer. But again, the lie of the enemy, that's not for you. Super spiritual Christians, they got that. That Sunday school class, they can do that. These folks can do that. It's not for you, though. That super spiritual prayer thing. No, it's for you. That's for me. That, that through the power of the Spirit of God, we can shape and change history through prayer. And the last one, that everyone can live and die with purpose. The Apostle Paul said, for me to live, what? Is Christ. 
okay? That it has become, Jesus has become the very reason for my life, the very purpose for what I'm about. And to die, that's even better. Because now I come face to face with Jesus. And that is on the table for everyone. Everyone can live and die with purpose. I can, you can, your coworker, your family member, your friend, they can too. It's not just for someone, friends. This is God's promise for everyone. We see this message uh, of someone getting trumped by Jesus' message of everyone in John chapter 9, if you have your scripture. I'm going to begin reading from the very first verse. This is John, he's talking about Jesus. This is what he says. He says, as he went along, he saw a blind man from birth, or a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world, Jesus said. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. We got one person. I'm going to read that again because maybe you missed what I said. This, this very same Jesus is in the room this morning, friends. So the man went and he washed and he came home seeing. Amen? Pretty decent miracle. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. So I want you to get a picture of this. What an amazing story this is. This guy's been blind from birth. Surely he's begging by the road, but he's not asking for spit and, and dirt and mud and, and, and the pool and all that. But this guy comes along and, and, and makes some mud and wipes it on his eyes, tells him to go wash. And then he can see. And the very next conversation he has are people going, no, oh, it's not you, man. You're not the same guy that we see begging day after day after day. Come on, man. And he's like, no, I am that man. Verse 10. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Can, can't you hear like the, <laughs> the undercurrent of our, our, our doubting culture? Even, even the undercurrent of the, the, the Christian culture in this that doubts. This guy had a miracle happen. And it's like, oh, really? Really? Ah, I'm not buying it. Right? See, this guy was a somebody over here. You can't get in. In fact, you're never going to get in. Because of your sin or your parents' sin or somebody's sin. There's no place in the family of God for you. You're not welcome to the table. You can't be a part of this synagogue in full. You're never really going to tap into the promises of God because obviously you've done something wrong. There's something wrong with you. You're born blind, so you're never going to be in the inner circle. You're never going to walk closely with God. You're, you're never going to be invited because there's something wrong with you. You're somebody who's never going to get it. But Jesus isn't interested in somebody getting it. He's interested in everybody getting it. And so he's trying to make a big point of how that happens. And so now the religious leaders show up. These Pharisees, these people who are holier than everybody else, right? They've got it all figured out. They're outwardly more religious. They show up on the scene and verse 13 says, So they brought to the Pharisees this man who had been blind. Now the day which Jesus made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Uh-oh. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. So red flag. Can't do that. Nobody who is born blind can receive their sight on the Sabbath. 
if making mud is involved. So they're upset. How did you receive their sight, they're asking him. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how could a sinner do such miraculous things? So they were divided. Now, can I suggest to you it's not just a Pharisee thing? This is a, this is a culture thing. This is a human thing. You could have a miracle happen in your life. And half the people will be like, praise God, look what God has done. And the other half people will be like, nah, man, I'm not buying it. Surely, this is a miracle. This man is from God. God, I don't think so, man. He's from the devil. So you and I need to keep our eyes open. We need to keep our ears attentive to the shepherd's voice. In the midst of this and follow Jesus with how he's trying to help us understand, amen. So they were divided, it says. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. That's, that's what I have to say about him. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? You want to talk about taking the safe road, listen to his parents. We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know that this man, they're talking about Jesus, we know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Now, it doesn't say in the text when he went to uh, his evangelism training class or uh, when somebody said to him, hey, by the way, now you have to go and tell other people about Jesus. I'm sure it's in there somewhere. I just can't find it. See, that's the natural part of this. The natural part of being touched by the power of Almighty God. When, when he touches your life and gives you a story of grace, you then have a story of grace to tell. If you're sitting at the table with the king, you invite others to join you there so they too can experience the promise and the purpose and the power of God. This is for everyone. You don't need a, a whole lot of training necessarily. You just need to be willing to speak up and say, man, I was blind and now I see. Let me tell you how. See, this power of God is available for everyone who wants to take hold of it and everyone church needs to hear about it so the pharisees couldn't see it they they had uh they had questions and hurdles and laws and moses and, and and the sabbath and all this stuff to deal with they couldn't see what god was doing right in front of them but this blind man he didn't have all those hurdles because all he all he saw in life was you're out and now for the first time in his life he was seeing that the only thing standing between him and fellowship in a circle and a seat at the table and, and a place in the family of God were religious leaders and whether or not they would invite him in. So it comes down to verse 26. I love this. They asked him, what did he do to you then? How did he open your eyes? Now, let me ask you, at what point do you lose your patience? I think I probably had already been there, but this guy finally starts to lose his patience. He says, he answered, I, I, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are Mo uh, Moses' disciples. So they're, they're saying, pick a side, right? 
we're on Moses' side, you're on the side of this Jesus, right? See, what they didn't understand, church, was that Jesus himself said that he came as the fulfillment of what Moses said. He came as the fulfillment of the law, that it was through the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus that, that everyone, Jesus brought everyone together in this glorious family where everyone now has access to the promise and the purpose and the power of God through Christ. They didn't see it. So they're trying to split it up. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, this Jesus fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Look at the inside of the blind guy who can now see. This man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. And listen to his theological understanding already. He says, we know that God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening eyes of a, blind, a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you are steeped at sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Now, whenever we talk about something like this, I think it's natural that there are people. We're talking about this idea of everyone. There's going to be a little, little, little ruffle around the edges like, yeah, everyone's invited to come, Brian, but you got to tell them, you got to tell them that, that they have to believe in Jesus. Everyone's invited pastor but they need to understand that that he's the way and the truth and the life they have to understand that the gate is narrow they have to understand that they they're going to re, be required they're going to need to be changed and transformed to become disciples they're going to need to be made into the image of jesus all that's true but but god in human flesh is standing here in the midst of this man born blind and he didn't walk up to this blind guy and say hey I see you have a problem here. Here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to spit in the dirt. I'm going to make some mud. I'm going to wipe it on your eyes. I need you to go and wash. And when you're done with that, I need you to do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Come back. I got this thing for you. And then you got a couple classes to take. And then you're going to come back. And the rest of us are going to sit around and, and, and make the decision of whether or not you get in. That's not what he said. He said, you need to see. Go wash in the pool of Siloam and see what happens. This is my invitation to you. Miracle sight. We said last week, church, even in our invitation, it's the Lord's table. He sets the pace. He teaches the manners. He transforms by the power of the Spirit so that ultimately he gets glory when you, I, and everybody else become more and more like Jesus. Church, it is not our job to say who's in or who's out. To list the requirements or to make an excuse for why someone doesn't get an invitation. Our job is to invite them to the table. The other day I was reading a story about Chuck Colson. Anybody, anybody know Chuck Colson? Some of you older folks probably know Chuck Colson. There's a story back in the 70s. One of the, regardless of your age, you've probably heard of the story of Watergate. <laughs> okay. One political party kind of rummaged through and ransacked. Uh, the other party, one of their headquarters, and, and a president had to resign, and a bunch of people went to jail. It was a mess. Well, one of those guys that had to go to jail uh, was a man by the name of Chuck Colson. He was a special counsel to the president. This was a guy who was Ivy League educated at Brown. He received his Juris Doctorate from George Washington University. He had climbed up through the ranks to become a special counsel to the president. Brilliant guy. He was known as the hatchet man for the president. So this is a dude you didn't want to mess with, right? So he's a smart guy, an educated guy, a political motivated guy. Somebody who got things done. Somebody you didn't want to run across. This is Chuck Colson. So Chuck Colson goes down in, amongst other people and goes to prison for this. One of his friends who was the CEO of a, of a corporation in America... Gave him a copy of C.S. Lewis writings, Mere Christianity. Anybody read that? Mere Christianity? Okay. So Colson's got all kinds of time on his hands at this point. And so he reads through Mere Christianity and Chuck Colson sees. 
God spits on the ground, makes mud, puts it on his eyes. And, and as he's reading the pages of this, Chuck Colson sees Jesus, gives his life to Jesus, surrenders to the lordship of Christ. While he's in prison, he starts to notice some things, injustice and inequity in the, in the I guess, the prison system and the system of incarceration. He starts li lifting up this, this system of prison, this, this cause of prison reform, and begins a ministry called Prison Fellowship, which still exists to this day. Tens, if hundreds of thousands of people have been uh, witnessed to, shared the gospel with, and they've seen countless people behind prison doors come to accept Jesus, be baptized, and churches started inside of prisons, all because of the radical conversion of Chuck Colson, a guy who most people would have said, I'm writing this dude off, you're never getting the invite. Jesus says, don't ever write anybody off, because this gospel is for everyone, and whether it's you, me, Chuck Colson, your neighbor, your family member, your coworker, your friend, Jesus wants to open our eyes. But pastor, you don't know my coworker, man. This dude, you ought to hear the way he talks. You ought to see the way, the things she does. So? Pastor, you don't know what I've been through, man. You don't know what my life is, the stuff I've done in life. You don't know the water under the bridge. I don't, but I know the blood that flowed down the cross, and it is enough. The table is for everyone. So we got this guy born blind, basically an ID card that says, you're never getting in. Okay? So much so that Jesus' own disciples, the guys that are with them every day for years, say, Who's, is, is it his sin, Lord? Is it his parents? This guy's messed up. Like, what's going on with this? Jesus said, neither one. This guy was born blind so that I could stand here today and show you all of what we need. And that's revelation sight. And so I'm going to do it right here in the physical with this man so you understand that it is possible in the spiritual. So listen to the conclusion here. It's pretty great. And this is how we'll close. So the Pharisees are missing the point, right? The family is caught up in this tension between do, do we stand with our son or, or, or do we stay in the church? The people in the community are talking about whether or not this blind guy is even the blind guy. And they're neglecting the fact that they should be chasing after Jesus, the one who gave him sight in the first place. But they're not. Here's what it always comes down to. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they'd thrown the man out, so he went and found him. Isn't that cool? Maybe you're here today and you don't know where you stand. Maybe you're watching online today and you're like, I, I haven't been to church in years. I don't, not really my thing. I, I don't know. I've been there. I was hurt. I've, I just stopped going. I fell out of the habit. I don't know. I just don't go to church. Maybe you're thinking of your family member, your coworker, your friend. Like, they don't go. They've never gone to church. They're not a church person. They probably never have, never will. I don't know. They're, they're just not here. You know what Jesus does? He goes and finds them. See, the message of the shepherd isn't, count them up, count them up, 99 out of 100, not bad. We got 99% participation in attendance today, praise God. No, he says, somebody's missing. I got to go find that guy. If you guys watch the gate for a minute, so I got to go get him. We don't know why the sheep got lost. Could have wandered off, could have got caught in the thicket, could have been an idiot. Could have been stubborn, could have been rebellious. Maybe wasn't paying attention. Jesus comes and finds the one. Jesus goes and finds this man and he asks him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? Listen to this guy. Like, he, he wants to know. Who is he, sir? The man asks, tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him in fact he's the one speaking to you and the men said lord i believe and he worshiped them see at some point 
you have to have revelation sight. doesn't matter how often you're here. doesn't matter how many sermons you hear. doesn't matter what kind of Bible study you go to. At some point, there's a moment in time where Jesus spits on the ground and wipes mud on your eyes and you wash it off and all of a sudden you can see. And if you need one more step, Jesus will come to find you. Do you believe in the Son of Man? I don't, I don't know. I don't know who he is. Tell me who he is. And you're looking at him, and he worshiped Jesus. So I'm just asking you today, has, has, has God been taking layers off? Has he been clarifying? Has he been bringing things into focus? Maybe today is that day where you're all of a sudden like, wow. Jesus is inviting me to the table. This is for me. I matter. Jesus loves me. I can be forgiven. I can walk in, in this righteousness that, that the Bible is talking about. I can be a change into a brand new, brand new person. I can be a part of the family of God. And catch this. And, and I get to be a part of seeing that happen in the lives of other people. I can share my faith and invite other people to the table to know this amazing God. This is the promise, church. This is the promise, and it's the invitation of Jesus. Are you at a table? Who are you inviting to your table? Table's for everyone. 